more than 50 migrants killed, cooked to death in the back of an abandoned trailer in the scalding Texas heat. Can this tremendous loss of life trigger an end to the partisan stalemate over border security? And in the nation's capital, explosive testimony before the January 6th committee. Did former President Trump actually say rioters sacking the Capitol were doing nothing wrong? And here at home, Sheriff Ed Gonzalez ends his stalled nomination to join Team Biden and lead Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I'm Greg Rugen and welcome to this special Independence Weekend edition of Watch Your Point, where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, longtime super neighborhood leader, Tamaro Bell. Next up, Chow Wynn, recovering journalist and now social worker with the Houston Area Women's Center. In the three spot, attorney and conservative commentator, Gary Polland. Batting cleanup, well-known businessman and columnist, Bill King. And closing us out, Bob Price, associate editor of Breitbart, Texas. Let's begin. A death chamber on wheels. Dozens of people trapped within a steel trailer, baking in the brutal South Texas heat. No doubt most sought opportunity and a new measure of freedom. And yet when a smuggler deserted his load on a San Antonio roadside, the dangerous gamble failed with catastrophic results. 53 people dead from exposure, lives lost as the inevitable result of callous criminal exploitation of the vulnerable, deeply problematic messaging of a more open border, and an immigration system locked in absolute dysfunction. Because of the way that the Biden administration is not enforcing the immigration laws, it's attracting people and, and enticing people to make this very dangerous trek causing them to lose their lives. This sort of tragedy, as you know, is going to be repeated over and over and over again as long as uh, the border is, uh, is out of control. It's gonna take people fading a little bit of heat uh, in their own political party to come up with the kind of answers that I think would, would, would go a long way to helping. Our state senior United States Senator expressing the hope that this tragedy, much like the mass murder in Uvalde, will trigger bipartisan compromise and generate some kind of pragmatic reform. Panel, what's your point? I want to start with Bob Price. Well, Greg, first, I, I, I have to hope that you're right on that, but there's no evidence to prove that that's even possible at, at this point. This is not an unusual occurrence. These human smugglers pack these people, these migrants, into these kind of trailers on a routine basis. This one made it through the, the checkpoint on Interstate 35, the Interior Border Patrol checkpoint, undetected. They can't x-ray every truck that comes through there. They can't run the dogs by every truck that comes through there. And so about 65 people are cooking in the back end of this truck, and it's not an unusual occurrence. The number is unusual for a single incident, but earlier this month, we had two people that died in a truck packed with 111 people in the back end of it. Another truck, a belly dump truck, had 65 people piled into this thing. There was so much weight in there that the people in the bottom of it, two people in the bottom of it were crushed. Does that make national news? No. 120 people died in the Rio Grande Valley sector, excuse me, the Del Rio sector, and it doesn't make news. To, on on uh, Wednesday this week, I reported about 55 migrants who died in Brooks County, one county that's not even on the border. It's 80 miles inland. And they've had 22 that died so far in, in the month of June. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's a common occurrence and it's policy that's creating this. When, when um, Joe Biden did away with all of the policies that reduced border, uh, from President Trump that reduced border crossings by 95% down to 9,000 crossings in May of 2019, to 220,000 in May of 2022. That's the consequence of this. I talked to Sheriff Benny Martinez in Brooks County this week, and he said they're seeing numbers that are just unimaginable of people coming through. And the Border Patrol agents can't be there to rescue them now because they're all tied up at the border babysitting people. You're gonna see this number continue to rise. The inhumanity of this crisis at the border is being ignored by the administration. 
Chow, I want to hear from you because you have something none of us here have, which is the experience of coming to this country, looking for freedom, finding it, and, and leading a successful life. As you watch what unfolded in San Antonio, what was going through your heart and mind? Now, let's not forget and perhaps center the attention on what Bob, he and I agree on the inhumanity of this crisis. We are forgetting that these are the situations where we need to take a really hard look at an asylum seeking program that's responsible, that offers a pathway for citizenship. Listen, I had a former nanny. She was smuggled here by coyotes. She lived a prosperous life. She has a picture of Reagan over her piano because he granted a pathway to citizenship called amnesty for her back in the 80s. And she and her husband and their children have led, led productive lives. I, I, I wonder if there were any real criminals in that 18-wheeler. Uh, I, I think these were citizens very desperate to come to this country. And, and, and to this issue about policy, let us not forget that Biden still has Title 42's policy in effect, that 1.7 million people to date have been turned away. So there are policies at the border to turn away people, but not enough attention has been done to uh, to, to focus on a, a responsible and a humane pathway to citizenship. All right, Bill King, uh, you heard Cornyn hint at, at, at the need, for potentially even the desire to find some type of pragmatic compromise. Uh, is this indicative of a political system that just isn't working? Well, certainly that. You know, I just want to I want to stop and, and, and talk for a second about if we'd had a mass shooting with 53 people uh, that were killed, uh, it would be nonstop news coverage for days and days. Uh, this is barely showing up in the 24 hour news cycle, especially on MSNBC and CNN, barely covered at all. Fox is covering it some. But, you know, 53 people died a horrible death. I mean, this was not, you know, I can't even imagine, you know, the kind of fear and terror that was going through their minds when they were sitting there suffocating to death in the back of a 18 wheeler. And this is purely because we have two political parties that both think that they get a political benefit from not solving this problem. Uh, George Bush had a great solution to this plan 20 years ago. Charles Foster, one of the best immigration lawyers in the United States right here in Houston, wrote the plan for him. But it requires both sides to give. And neither side wants to give because they think they benefit from it politically. And the blood of these people and all the other deaths that Bob has been documenting on this show week after week after week is on the hands of the two political parties that think that the political benefit from this outweighs those lives. Tamar Bell, we've got 30 seconds in this segment. We're going to hear from Gary in the next. What's your take? Um, first off, my condolences to all of those people and their family. Because do you understand that, that the families that they left helped them get on that truck for what they thought would be a promised land opportunity for them, and that's gone. And you're right, it's not on TV. It's not on the news because they don't give a damn. They don't care, just like the people die who try to come from Haiti to Florida and the boats capsize. They don't even show that anymore. People still trying that. They don't care. Got to leave it there. Still to come, explosive testimony before the January 6th committee with a White House insider claiming Donald Trump sought to join the rioters at the Capitol. But up next, the critical midterms just four months away. Which of many critical issues will attract the most voters? Our extended discussion is coming up on the other side of this break. Welcome back as we continue our discussion of the pivotal issues most likely to impact the midterm election, now just four months away. Crippling inflation, ongoing border crisis, violent crime, or the freedom to abort a pregnancy. Which concern or combination of concerns will push the most Americans to cast ballots and in so doing decide the path forward. Panel, the latest Associated Press poll telling us 85% of Americans say the country is on the wrong track and 79% describe our economy as, quote, poor. Bill King, that seems like an opportunity for a third party. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, um, look, the, the Republicans should have the wind at their back in the midterms. That's just historically the pattern. And then the Biden administration has been so dysfunctional on so many different levels, and they've gotten some bad breaks on top of that. But I tell you, the Republicans are like trying to, you know, grasp defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, I think I think the Roe decision is going to hurt them some. I don't think I don't think not many people vote because of abortion. There's a lot of people that have very strong feelings about that, but they've already decided who they're going to vote for. Um, but also, I got a call from a banker friend of mine who's a lifelong Republican and said, I think I'm going to vote Democrat. And it had to do with um, with the GOP convention in Texas and, you know, passing a resolution, you know, secede, just, he said, I just can't put up with this anymore. I just can't be associated with this anymore. So I, I do think there's a sort of steady drip, drip, drip of things that are going to hurt the Republicans. But, um, but I think that probably Carver was right. It's going to be the economy. Unless there's something pretty dramatic happens between now and November. Um, I think the Republicans are probably going to have a pretty good, pretty good year. Bob Price, 85% of Americans saying we're on the wrong track. Do you think that's a reflection of the Biden administration? Well, I think if you look at two of the biggest crises that we face in this country right now, the the uh, inflation that in large part is due to the intentional policies of the Biden administration to cut U.S. oil production and, and make us more dependent on foreign oil. And then the things that cascaded from that that caused us massive inflation in terms of the, the price of gasoline, which impacts every single market in, in the economy because everything has to be transported somewhere. Uh, that and, and then this crisis on the border, which was also intentionally created by policies in the Biden administration that created a sense of lawlessness. People are concerned about lawlessness right now, whether it's at the border, whether it's driving on a freeway in Houston or, or walking in a mall in Minneapolis, or walking down the street in downtown Portland. Crime is rampant across the country and people are afraid of that. All right, tomorrow, Bell, uh, you lost a, a, a good friend this week to that lawlessness. Is that is that the biggest issue going on now? Uh, yeah, a, a community leader. I mean, it. Uh, this gentleman represented so much in this area uh, for decades and to hear that he died by someone on a road rage on a freeway that they don't own, that none of us own, that we're only in a, a one space for a millisecond if traffic is moving and that's grounds to take somebody's life. That is a big concern. But I uh, can't say that the bloodbath that I thought the Democrats were going to have is still the same because, you know, maybe you are no longer at the breeding age. But if you're at the breeding age, they're taking this Roe versus Wade decision really, really hard that the same party that told them ain't no way in hell, I'm taking a, a vaccine. The government can't make me take a vaccine. I lean toward no vaccine can tell a woman nine months, or even if you are pregnant by your troglodytic uh, half brother or your cousin or your stepfather or your uncle, you're gonna have that baby uh, uh, is, is, a, is a really blow to their mind that the government can tell you that with your body that this is what you must do. When in fact, we all know that is not what's gonna happen because if abortions occurred before abortions were legal and that's not gonna stop them. It will stop safe ones and you will have more people dying from the mortality, mortality rate. But I'm telling you that decision, this decision has awakened uh, uh, younger people, especially women who might not have been engaged just like people who were awakened after George Floyd's murder. So I do believe the economy, but I believe this Roe versus Wade is gonna have some pushback from the public, especially the women. All right, we'll talk more about that. When we come back, I'm asking our panel just how growing concern over the economy, rising crime and illegal immigration could impact our local election come November. Welcome back. As we draw closer to the midterms, the stakes are particularly high here in Harris County. Some have described the decision facing voters as a watershed moment with the real potential to reject and reverse the hard left governance of Judge Lena Hidalgo and her allies or accept it as the best path forward. Mired in a corruption scandal, accountable for a botched primary, a vastly expanded county bureaucracy and an ongoing public safety crisis, the incumbent Democrat is clearly vulnerable, 
My question for the panel, will any of the major national issues like inflation, abortion, gun reform, or illegal immigration trickle down and impact local races? I'm gonna start with you, Gary Poland. Well, I, I think, uh, I like to say all politics is local. So I think first people are gonna be concerned about runaway crime. I think they're gonna be concerned then about scandal and wasteful spending by the, the, the county leadership. Look, you drive around Harris County, you look at, first of all, look and see if you ever see any sheriff's office cars patrolling, not very often, because there's not enough of them. Uh, think about the deteriorating condition of our roads and infrastructure, because the money's been diverted for uh, crazy left-wing schemes, not liberal schemes, but crazy leftist schemes. You're like, Lena Hidalgo is the functional equivalent in Harris County of AOC. That's her constituency. She got foisted on the people because uh, no one else wanted to run against the incumbent there, and she did, so she got the nomination, and uh, the Democrats did well in Harris County. We had straight ticket voting, she wins, okay? Now she's got to run on her record. Her record is terrible. She's a disaster. And when people say that four more years of her leadership in Harris County will destroy this county, they are spot on right. She needs to go, and I think the Republicans have a great candidate there. I think she's gonna, lose. She's gonna, she's gonna get beat in November. Chow Wen, what is your point? I, I disagree with Gary. I don't think that Lena is quote unquote a disaster as you call it. I consider that name calling. I don't teach that to my kids. <laughs> I think that uh, I think Lena's got name recognition. She's hard fought. She's working against you know the powers that be or trying to criminalize this situation. I understand it's mired in controversy. I see you tomorrow. But I think the voters are not concerned about what we're hearing. They're concerned about things like crime. I think you're right, runaway crime. Uh, are, are our communities safe? Is gun violence really threatening the safety of children and women and families in this community? I think that's what the voters are going to focus on, not the stuff that gets splashed on the news about Lena and, and her constituents week on and week off. All right, I got 30 seconds for you tomorrow. Uh, I disagree totally, totally everything with y'all, what she just said. I do believe Lena's gonna get whooped. I do believe that Lena's the problem and one of the main reasons why crime is out of control with what was supposed to be mail, about bail bond reform for misdemeanors that's turned into felonies where people murder on Monday, get out on Tuesday, murder on Wednesday, get out on Thursday, murder again on Friday, and, they, and the bail bonds is 50 cents. That's a problem for her, absolutely. And I keep telling you all, 25 plus thousand more Republicans voted in the primary than Democrats. They laughed at that in 2018 when it was more Democrats, and look who got the seat. So we'll see. Bill, final 30 to you. I think it's going to be a close election. Um, I won't use the word disaster because I don't want to offend child, but uh, I, I mean, just tell me one thing that's working in Harris County. I mean, just one thing that's actually working down there right now, and I can't, I can't see anything. Uh, that's working. Become the elections, the IT, to you know, uh, the roads, the flooding. I mean, nothing is work. Nothing is getting done. And every time I hear her talk or see her on social media, it's all about some national issue. Now she needs to go run for Congress if she wants to talk about that stuff. But in the meantime, fix the flooding and the roads. Gonna leave it there. Just ahead, dramatic testimony from an eyewitness working in the West Wing on January 6th. Did Donald Trump actually say his vice president? deserve to be lynched. Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. Ex-White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson recounting a tense conversation involving Ch Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, as the U.S. Capitol was being stormed by rioters. It was just one round in a barrage of explosive testimony from an eyewitness inside the West Wing, just feet from the Oval Office on and before the January 6th attack. In further testimony before the January 6th committee, Hutchinson confirmed that the Trump White House knew in advance of potential violence and that the former president wanted metal detectors removed from his rally, despite intel that many in the crowd were armed. Take the effing mags away. They're not here to hurt me. Let them in, let my people in. They can march to the Capitol after the rally's over. 
Hutchinson also testified that Trump wanted to join the rioters as they marched on the Capitol, but was ultimately prevented by Secret Service. Panel, there was a great deal more, all of which the former president has downplayed or flat out denied. Uh, Bob, what was your take on all this? Well, first, the, in, the insurrection, I'm going to call it an insurrection, was a, a disaster for this nation, a, a blemish on our, our national history. Uh, and everybody that was involved in it should be punished. And many of them have been and many more are going to be. Um, but that said, this hearing is nothing more than a, a kangaroo court. Our courts are set up to have an adversarial relationship. You have a prosecutor, you have a defense attorney, you have testimony, you have cross-examination. None of that is happening here. This is like going into trial as an accused and having the, the prosecution getting to present all of the witnesses and having no cross-examination of those witnesses whatsoever. The jury is the American people, and the jury is only seeing one side of the story here. They're allowing hearsay evidence. They're allowing evidence that would never be allowed in a court. And, and, and it's all, in my opinion, it's just political theater. I'm told that a lot of this is for the benefit of the Justice Department, Chow. I mean, did you find something compelling about what you saw in this latest hearing? I think the American people deserve to hear the, you know, 170,000 uh, pages of documents that were combed over and the, the 1,600 interviews that were reviewed. Um, the American people have a, an opportunity to watch and listen and make their own decisions and judgments about what happened. I do agree this was a terrible state in American history, and this gives the American people an opportunity to hear and learn more when they don't. I mean, at least our lawmakers comb through that. Um, I will say it does play out like a TV show, right, with sound bites and clips and then and, and really shortened and, and launched on prime time, those kinds of things. But um, we live in a country of convenience and people want their, their you know, information in, in doses and this is what they're getting. All right, Gary Pollan, uh, Liz Cheney, Congresswoman Liz Cheney has a very conservative record and yet she has been excoriated, just, uh, outed by the by the Republican Party as, as a turncoat. Uh, you know, what is your take on her performance and, and what she's bringing the American public? Uh, well, I don't think she's bringing the American public anything. She she's fallen in line with the Pelosi plan for this committee. The fact that they're that they did not let the Republicans appoint who they want to the committee like you do in almost every other congressional committee is shocking and it sets up the situation where it's not credible this is a partisan witch hunt uh i don't i don't know what the actual truth is i mean we, we hear from the lady yesterday it was hearsay and then we're hearing today that the secret service agents who were involved said it's not true so maybe the committee will actually call some adversarial witnesses who have a different story to tell as opposed to the party line as written by pelosi and her democratic clones and that's the problem with this and the other problem, Greg, that really bothers me is the, the situation that happened there on January 6th pointed out some things that need to be done to fix our laws in terms of elections to make sure we don't have them messed with. And hey, what have you heard about that from this committee? Crickets. Tomorrow, Bill, what was your take on what you heard yesterday? Oh, God, I'm too busy laughing at Gary towing that line because what I did here, you know, and what they don't like, Liz Cheney said, look, I'm going to tell y'all what, you know, you can hate me, say I ain't Republican. No, my, my daddy was only the vice president, but I'm not Republican. Let me tell you, what I like about what I'm seeing is that we saw this unfolding. We didn't know a lot of the back information. I didn't know that there were people who actually went to the White House the day before and were actually, when they were supposed to be going because of COVID, you're not supposed to be doing no tours, but they were doing them. I didn't know any of that. Now that lady said before she started talking, this is hearsay, you know, I heard this from, she made a point and said, well, this is what was told to me. And so before she said it, she didn't say I was there, I saw it. So yes, I hope they do get the people to come forward. But what has really been telling to me, I'm not gonna lie to y'all, is Barr. The fact that Barr was like, I told them. And when Trump's daughter's like, well, I believe Barr, when they, why did you believe him? Well, he's credible and I trust him. That was a shocker to me. I couldn't believe that, that this girl was like, I believed him. Uh, I, I basically not saying it, but like, I didn't believe my daddy. I believe Barr. Yeah, we knew we lost. I mean, that was, I'm glad that came out. I really, I, I did. I'm very glad that came out. Got to leave it there. Still to come, Harris County Sheriff Ed Gonzalez, 
dropping his 14-month bid to lead immigration and customs enforcement. But up next, Supreme Court vindication for a high school coach fired for praying on the field after games. I really don't know what to say. I, I just can't stop smiling. And, you know, thank God and thank everybody that supported me. And I, I found out that I'm not insane. Former Bremerton, Washington high school football coach Joseph Kennedy reacting to news that the Supreme Court ruled his practice of praying on the field after games was protected by the Constitution. Dissenting liberal justices on the court claimed Kennedy's prayers improperly incorporated his religious beliefs into a school event and had a coercive impact on students. But the conservative majority said Kennedy's post-game religious observance was protected speech during a time when he was no longer responsible for overseeing students. Panel, what's your take here? Did the firing of Coach Kennedy amount to government overreach or was it necessary to maintain the strict separation of church and state? Uh, a quick take from you, Bill King. Yeah, I, I think we've gotten carried away with this. Uh, look, I, I'm not a big fan of praying in public because I read Matthew 7 where Jesus says you're not supposed to do that. But if that's what somebody wants to do, then, you know, I think that's their decision. I think about, you know, the, you see how many of these uh, baseball players come off and do a cross or point up to the sky or something like that or kneel in the end zone. And look, I just you know, let people do what they want to do. I don't care what their religion is. Just let them do it. And let's just stop making such a big deal out of this whole thing. Yeah, Chow, you know, this can get really, really uh, complicated fast. What if somebody says that wearing a headscarf is, uh, you know, a coercive religious gesture? I, I, I understand what you're saying, but there is also a matter of separation of church and state. I mean, this coach is a representative of the public school, and he's doing it on public school property. Um, I think it's a really strong and, and, and dangerous message that, you know, there is no such thing as that separation of church and state in, in our country, and that, that is a, a, a disappointment and a terrible message to send. All right, tomorrow, take 20 seconds. That's the problem with uh, the schools right now. You took the Lord out, and now you got the guns in because you took God out. That's the problem. Okay, Bob, go ahead. <laughs> there is such a thing as no separation of church and state. That is not in the Constitution. The Constitution says you shall not establish a government religion. A football coach praying on a sideline is not establishing a government religion, and he wasn't coercing people. Final word to Gary Pollan. Uh, my final word is amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, you, Bill, you think we're going to see more cases like this really quick? I, I don't know. Um, you know, it seems like to me we're kind of moving beyond this. I think this may be kind of a, uh, a, uh, a period at the end of this sentence, actually. All right. Tomorrow, Bill, uh, you, you think this is much ado about nothing? No, I'm glad he won. I'm not kidding. I'm sick of that. People say they don't want you to read the Bible. How come that's not an attack of your religious freedom? I, that, that is a problem for me, okay? You don't want to pray with me, that's fine. But don't tell me I can't say thank you, God. Oh, you offended me. Leaving it there. Up next. As invading Russians painfully gain ground, Western leaders pledge more money and weaponry to fuel Ukraine's fight for survival. Vladimir Putin was hoping uh, that he would be getting less NATO on, uh, on his Western uh, front as a result of his uh, unprovoked illegal invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, he's been proved completely wrong. He's getting more NATO. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Western leaders doubling down on their support of embattled Ukraine four months after the Russian invasion. In a unified statement of the G7 nations, leaders pledged continued military and humanitarian aid for as, quote, long as it takes, and pledge to further escalate the economic isolation and punishment of Vladimir Putin's Russia. Panel, the U.S. has committed at least $40 billion. Should there be a ceiling on how much we ultimate, ultimately send to President Zelensky? I'm going to start with you, Bob. I, I think we need to do whatever we can to, to stop Putin from succeeding 
in Ukraine. Uh, all he's accomplished there so far is killing millions of people and driving countries that were kind of in the middle, not wanting to join NATO, but liking the privilege of being next to it and feeling protected from it, to solidly wanting to get into the NATO camp now. Yeah, Europe needs to step up even bigger and bring as much support as they can to these freedom fighting people who are fighting the bravest battle I've seen in my lifetime. All right, Chow, I'm curious to, uh, to hear what you have to say about this. Yeah, I, I'm on board with, with Bob. I, I think that Americans would trade the high gas prices that we're feeling at the pump to, uh, to ensure that, that, that Ukraine stayed independent, democratic, free country. And, you know, the humanitarian crisis we're seeing, the women and children who are still living in shelters away from, uh, you know, their families and, and having their husbands and, and partners fight in this war uh, are egregious. Uh, it is time to bolster support for Ukraine as we're going into the fifth month of war. Jump in here, Gary Pollan. Look, uh, I, I share the concerns and, and Putin is a real scumbag. There's no question about it. But here's what's going on now in Ukraine. The Russians are successfully destroying the Ukrainian economy. We have uh, tons and tons of grain that's one of the main products for export for Ukraine sitting in ports blockaded by the Russians. That grain needs to get out or it's going to create food crises around the world, not, not just in this country, but in countries where they really need the grain. You remember, you go back a decade or so, we had food riots in a number of Arab countries because there were problems with availability and pricing. So that's a problem. My concern with what the administration is doing here in Washington is I think it's piecemeal. We, give them, we don't give them this weapon because, boy, they could use it to project power into Russia. But if you don't put Russia on the defensive in this case, the, the, the matter is not going to go away. They're going to swallow what part of that country they want and Ukraine's going to run out of uh, people they can put in to go into fight. So it's a real problem. Uh, do I think we should do anything? No, because we have to be careful. Russia is a nuclear power. We don't want nuclear weapons introduced into this transaction. Uh, and the group is right that the Europeans need to do more than just talk, because that's what we're mostly getting. All right. Coming up, a local judge facing criminal charges for abuse of power. We will hear from his alleged victim and why he's calling for the accused to be removed from the bench. Welcome back. You know what they say about payback. Harris County Misdemeanor Court Judge Daryl Jordan indicted and jailed this week on a charge of official oppression. The allegation stems from the 2020 arrest of well-known investigative reporter and consultant Wayne Dolcefino on a contempt of court charge. Jordan accused Dolcefino of interrupting court proceedings, later imposing a sentence of three days in jail and a $500 fine. What the judge would learn later is that Dolcefino was wearing a hidden camera, generating potentially powerful evidence later reviewed by prosecutors and possibly presented to a grand jury as proof Jordan abused his power. This was all about payback for him. And I think a judge that does that is disqualified. I'm gonna just say it plain and simple. They don't like seeing African-Americans on the bench. Hope somebody told uh, attorney Oliver Brown that this case is being prosecuted by Fort Bend County DA Brian Middleton, who happens to be black. Panel, how about some quick takes on this uh, development? Starting with you tomorrow. Uh, look, I know our former colleague was gonna uh, not sleep. <laughs> Okay, until he got his retribution for what he was put through. So I am not surprised. I want to see how this goes. As you all know, Daryl Jordan has been, according to his colleagues, one of the people who are pushing them to do the felony bond reform, so they say. And so I really want to see how this goes. It plays out. I'm watching. All right, Bill King, 30 seconds. This guy does not have a judicial temperament. He should not be on a court. Um, and I just, I get so tired of the race card being played like that. This has nothing to do with the race. It has to do with his atrocious, you know, uh, improper conduct as a judge. All right, we're going to leave it there. Up next, after more than a year in limbo, Sheriff Ed Gonzalez calls an end to his extended bid to join Team Biden. Welcome back. After 14 months of controversy and pushback from multiple forces, Harris County Sheriff Ed Gonzalez has withdrawn from consideration to lead U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement.
Panel, while Gonzalez faced questions about his personal life, criticism from the union representing his deputies, and a class action lawsuit alleging dangerous conditions at the jail he oversees, this confirmation was mostly stalled by partisan gridlock in a 50-50 Senate. I'm going to start with you, Chow. What's your take on this? You know, uh, to his credit, he, Ed Gonzalez, you know, he is a member of the board former member of the board of the Houston Area Women's Center. He's on our advisory council. He's always been very passionate about serving our community. Former city council member, former police officer, now sheriff. Um, and he was exonerated of those domestic dispute allegations that, 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 that was swirling around back in July uh, of 2021 by the committee that was investigating the, uh, the, the House committee. Now, what, what I will say is, in, in some ways, I'm glad he's staying in our community because we do need a respected servant leader, and that's who Ed is. And that's the experience I've seen and the experience of many people in this community. Bob, you've been watching this nomination. What's your take? Well, on this show in 2021, I said that that Ed Gonzalez was probably one of the best picks that uh, that Joe Biden could have made to take that position. Uh, he was very strong in supporting the the turning over of criminal aliens to ICE for deportation and, and stayed that way. Even though he ended the 287G program, he didn't change any of the policies in how the jail actually worked. Um, but that said, I, at that time, I also said that I didn't think he would get nominated specifically because of that, because I think it, it's a bipartisan gridlock that's actually stopping him from moving forward because there are very many Democrats who don't like his policies on immigration and would not want to see him. Tomorrow's going to have some other things to say as to why she thinks he's not going forward. But I was really surprised when he was renominated in January of this year. Tomorrow, you've got 30 seconds. I am not surprised, and I would have withdrawn my name a lot sooner than this. The um, When this allegation of domestic abuse came out and the officer who said he had body cam on at the time uh, and they were disputing it, he had not one, not two, three different affidavits came to that was sworn that said they were told consistently to delete camera footage that was not favorable to the leadership of Houston Community College. In addition to that, a lady came forward who does not want to be named because she is about to retire, who said that the wounds that she saw on the back of his wife's back, that she helped her with those so those people who want to say it but you know when you work around domestic abuse people long enough you should know they're the first ones to defend their abusers and most people should know better than to say that all right i want to go to a, a subject to close out this segment uh this is uh, independence weekend uh, bob you had a good thought earlier well i think as we approach the 246th anniversary of our nation's founding we we need to be remembering that that like Ukraine depends on us now, we would not be an independent nation if it were not for the support, foreign support of France during our war for independence. I'd like to hear from Gary on that topic too, real quick. Well, on, on July 4th, what I think about is the importance of teaching our children uh, about America and, and the truth, the founding of America, what it was all about, what it's about now, and that, and that includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I think it's important that they know that because I feel like lately, the last few years, all we're hearing about is America is, is bad. America bad, America not perfect, not a good thing. I think we need an objective overall view of what America is so people appreciate it. You know, there's a reason why we have millions of people trying to get into this country illegally. It's because it's not because it's a racist country. It's not because it's a bad country. It's because it's the best country on earth. And I understand when you talk about that, we're grading on a curve. All right, Bill, just a few thoughts from you. You know, um, I, I was, um, I got a picture sent to me by my daughter the other day. It was my grandson's 10th birthday. And he had a picture of all the kids that he invited to his birthday party. Two white kids, two black kids, two Asian kids, a Latino. And, you know, and, and it wasn't, the, there was no quotas. These were, these were just his buddies that he invited to his party. And, you know, I really think, you know, this, that is America to me. And I think we ought to celebrate that on the 4th of July. Got to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next with Fox News Sunday. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week.